Hello and welcome to an all new Max Chroma video. In this video, I'm going to be showing you guys an update that I've made to the actions in the Max Chroma Photo Tessellator 2022. Now, this is a paid product that I have available on my payhip.com slash Max Chroma web store, and you can get it right here at this link. It is $50. Now there's another product, the Max Chroma Custom Colorizer 2022, that's for $10. That's actually included in this product here. And if you get the Max Chroma Paid Products Bundle for $65, you'll get the Photo Tessellator and the Full Spectrum Gradient Map and the Max Chroma Master Colorizer that's a $90 value just for $65. And each of those does include the Custom Colorizer, so that's included in that as well. Um, what I'm going to show you guys is if you were to either have purchased this already, you'll get the upgrades for free, or if you buy the new product, I'm going to show you how to install the actions. And I've also included this time the Max Chroma Color Blender and Halftone Tessellator. This is a plugin that works for Photoshop CS6 and CC version 14. One of the things I've done with the new action in the Photo Tessellator 1.8 update is I've added some of the scripts from the Halftone Color Blender, and I've made it so they can now work in the modern Photoshop version 2022. The other thing that's really cool is I've included a version of the Photo Tessellator 1.8 that works in Photoshop CS6 and CC14, and probably going back to some of the other CC versions. So what I'm gonna show you guys is when you download the files, you'll actually get a bunch of different zip files, and there's also a Photoshop file in there. And each of these zip files, if you unzip them, you would have these different folders. Now, one of the things is the action, the reason that I put them in these different zips is so that you don't have to re-download something like this big 1.3 gigabyte file every time I just make an update to the actions. So I put all the action files in one zip in the download. So if you're just trying to upgrade to the 1.8 version, you don't need to re-download everything. It's just the action file zip. There's also the Max Chroma Color Blender Pack. And if you don't already have that installed, it is a free plugin. But if you don't have it installed and you want to make sure it's going to work in this new version, you can also install that. Now I've included that folder here as well. I'm going to show you guys how to install the action files for the new update, the pattern files that would be required, and the Max Chroma Color Blender in this video. So one of the first things we're going to do is just set up the action files and the pattern files. So in Photoshop, this is version 2022, I'm going to go to Window, Patterns, and I don't have anything loaded right now. So I'm going to go to the Pattern Files folder here. I'm going to grab the Photo Tessellator Halftone Patterns.pat file. We're going to drag that into Photoshop here. So now these patterns are installed. This is what the action is going to use as it goes through and does some of those separation and half toning um, routines. So the next thing I'm going to do is install the action files. So if I had unzipped the action files folder, I would get this action files right here and I would be able to go in and see that there's still the original 1.1 version, but now there's a 1.8 version and there's a couple of different files for it. One of them is the CS6 and CC14. So you can now use this in the older versions of Photoshop there, and you would install the patterns. You would just install the patterns a slightly different way. Um, you, I think you can drag them in, but you could also go to like the brushes and the preset manager through the brushes. I might make a separate video to show how to install this in CS6. So I'm gonna actually go to the user mode action set full stops, and that's different from the full automatic mode action set with no stops in it. And I'll show those in some upcoming videos with the differences between those two. But basically one of them is going to have a lot of times where it stops and asks you to choose certain things like the DPI and the halftone pattern, the, um, the LPI of the, and the angles of the halftones. And there's ways I've set it up where you can kind of um, choose some settings and have it kind of go through automatically. But then there's some that it really stops for and keeps asking you different questions about that stuff. There's a full automatic mode set if you really just want it to run all the way through automatically and just give you the halftone result. But let's start off with the user mode action set. And so this is the, the Photoshop 2022 version. We're going to drag this into the actions panel right here. 
and I'm going to just go ahead and set it right now with this uh, button right here to the button mode. And then if, if, if it kind of looks like this when you do that, you're going to want to just drag this from your actions panel and you'll, uh, you'll drag it all the way over like that. And I like to have it over here. And then what I do is um, have it, I just have it like this so that all the labels of the actions can be read like this. And you could scroll all the way down and see the whole list vertically like that. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is look at the color blender and how to install that so it works in the old versions of Photoshop CS6 and CC14 with that plugin panel. And also you're going to see when you install that, it's going to give you these uh, folder files that will then allow this action set to run in the new Photoshop and pull up some of those scripts. So it's using the scripts. If you already have that installed there, um, the main drive folder has these scripts in it. So if it's already installed in your system, you don't need to do anything. But if you never downloaded and installed the Max Chroma Color Blender, there's this Color Blender pack.zip. Inside that zip folder, there's a main drive folder and a PS Plugins Panels folder and some installation instructions. I'm going to show you guys how to install it right now. So what we're going to do here is say in the main drive folder, there's this Max Chroma Color Blender folder. All you need to do is copy that folder and then you're going to go to your main C drive and make sure that that's pasted in the C drive just by itself here. And so I've already got that here and inside that folder there's the resources and the scripts. So that's now installed and the action can work in the 2022 version. This doesn't install the plugin for your older versions of uh, Photoshop CS6 or CC 2014 or a CC version 14, sorry. So inside the other file here is the PS plugins panels folder. Inside that you would actually grab this Max Chroma Color Blender folder. I'll right click and copy that. And what we would do is go to these other folders under the C drive. There's two different places. One of them is going to install it for the 64 bit version of the program. And the other one will install it for the 32 bit version. So you would go into the main C drive and then program files, Adobe, and then you'll go down to Adobe Photoshop CS6, 64 bit, plugins, panels, and then you see I've already got it in here, but you would basically copy and then paste right in here. And then the next place to put it would be in the Photoshop CC 64 bit and go into plugins, panels, and paste it there as well. The other way to put it into the 32-bit version of Photoshop would be the Program Files x86 folder. You'll click into there, you'll go to Adobe, and you'll see Photoshop CS6. You would go into Plugins, Panels, and install it there. So let me just right-click, copy from the PS Plugins Panels folder into this Plugins Panels folder. We'll just paste that in here. I usually don't use the 32-bit versions, but sometimes um, people aren't aware which version they're running when they double-click the Photoshop icon. So it might be using the 32-bit version, and I want to show you how to install it in both places. Okay, we'll go back. We'll go to the Photoshop CC folder, Plugins, Panels, and we'll also paste it here. Okay, so that's all set like that. And then... I'm not going to do it in this video, but I'll show in the next video where I uh, teach you guys how to like put the actions, the, the CS6 version of the actions into those older versions of Photoshop. I'll show you how when you open those after doing that installation procedure, the plugin panel shows up. Okay, so now we're in the 2022 version of Photoshop, and we've gone and um, we downloaded this, we installed it, the actions part, and we downloaded this and installed that. Okay, so, and again, let's just double check. We've got the patterns loaded, and we also have these scripts installed in that main location of the um, C drive, right? So we have the scripts loaded. These will be run by some of these down here, these actions that run the uh, scripts. Okay, but we're not going to look at that in this video. So we're going to start off probably with a test pattern, and I think I might just use something like this one here, a grayscales test pattern, and we will do um, something like another kind of 
test. Let me just do this one here. Because one of the things I want to get into in showing how to use these actions to work with different types of files is that basically there's a different way to look at certain types of images that you might not already know or be aware of, which is whether or not those images contain a lot of primary or preset color blend points like primary, red, white and black and gray or things like all these different bright hues with all these tints and tones and shades of them. And it's like these kind of images with um, lots of color in all sorts of different regions and lots of uh, light and dark, these would be considered like a full color image and you could reproduce it with custom colors, but you might be changing it a little bit. Sometimes these are better to reproduce like in half tones using the primary color blend points. Okay. And then another way to look at some images is that they are limited or custom color blend points. Like this image could be reproduced with just these three points of color on the outside of this triangle here. Okay. It could be also all the different um, tones and shades and tints of this image are all done by blends of this sort of darker orange color, this lighter tan color and this darker like navy blue color. Okay, and so this car image could possibly be done with like a shade of this brown, a uh, tint of this kind of tan color, and or maybe just one middle region of this with some black and some white and some gray possibly, or just black and white in that color. You might have to use some yellow for the lights there. This photo, this dog would just be done with maybe a couple of colors. Same with this one here. These right here, like this is kind of a gold yellow, a darker red, more of a metallic looking blue, and then the brick red in the background. So none of these are really like the pure bright colors, but the primaries might be able to do this one or the custom colors. This image here, it could be made out of a couple of custom colors of like these tints and shades and that background sky color. Okay, so these would be images where you would just pick custom color points and not have it blend out of all the primary colors. But you can really do both images in a couple of different ways like that. So looking at the action set, that's some of the things that you would be going into using an image and maybe how to know which actions to run. But I'm going to cover all of that in the videos that go over this stuff. Okay, I just wanted to show a little bit of that. Now, one of the first things I'll do is maybe... Maybe I will pull up this other color test file here. And we'll just start off. We'll show some of the actions that are added and some of the actions that were already there. And then I'll get into some of the new stuff. And we won't go into everything in this video. I just wanted to show how to install it, how to get started, and how to see some of the new actions. So the first thing is just the label of this, the Max Chroma Photo Tessellator. This button doesn't do anything. This also is just a label 2022 version 1.8.0 and the label here that says user mode custom actions. Now I've got these divider actions here. There's, there's no action in it. It doesn't do anything when you click on it, but it helps divide and break up the list of different action groups in the set. So the first group is actually HWB enhancements. Now these are some of the things you might do to the image before you get started. If you wanted to enhance it or trick it or set it up in a different way, before going into the other things, but it would be kind of based on some of the knowledge I was showing in the different types of images. You might know what you're going to do ahead of time, but these are all here because I'm going to teach and show in these videos how to handle different kinds of images and use them in this photo tessellator action. But I'll show you what it does. Like the first one, the hues and grayscales gradient map, this creates the full spectrum gradient map 1.3 file. It basically takes the image, converts it into, it's, it splits it into just the hues and then just the grayscales. Okay, so we've got just the hues and they're totally revealed. And then we have a chroma gradient that goes over that to make it blend with the grayscales. And we have the grayscales here, and those are also revealed completely underneath the hues. And then we have the chroma gradient that knocks that out. So when these two combine together, you get the original image recreated, but now it's split up into the hues with a chroma gradient and the grayscales with a chroma gradient. The cool thing about the gradient map aspect is actually this whole hue region is rebuilt in this folder right here, this group, 
with a gradient map. Okay, so this you can go into and actually change any of the hue locations and any of their colors directly. I could change what that color of that yellow is directly to any other hue, any other tint, tone, or shade. And I can even move them around. So I could actually move this over. I could make the yellows be like there instead. Let's cancel that. You would have the chroma gradient knocking that out. And you would then have the grayscales group over that. Now in the grayscales group, and if you see some stuff that looks like kind of an artifact, it's usually just because you're zoomed out. Okay. So I'm looking at this and with the gradient map uh, over the grayscales, we've also got, let's just go ahead and click on it. You can adjust any of the points like, um, let me see here, the, the black and gray and white. So you can just go over to this and I can change the color of the black to anything I want. Adjust it, change it, make it anything or even move it. I could like move the, I could bring the black in darker. I could take this gray point. I could just remove that if I want. Maybe I just want black and middle gray and white. And I could move the gray point lower or higher. And I can also change that gray to any color I want, etc. And you know, the cool thing is you could actually do color separations with just this right here, because you could go in and say, well, I want the, um, you know, this green region of the hues to be a separation. And so you could go in and just directly change that. Because now it's a color, you could just set it to any color, you could set that to black, and you could set these others to white. Or you could have it blend in a specific way, any different hues. On this test image, it works a certain way. On other images, it's going to work the same, but it's going to give you those hue points. They don't always have all those colors in them. So we'll show in other examples how that would work. But basically, you could extract this green separation just like that. You could extract a custom gray separation the same way. Like maybe I just want this light gray and I want it to blend all the way to the black. I'll make the black become white. And I've got this other white up here. And so there we just pulled a, black, uh, a light gray separation that blends with all the hues, tints, tones, and shades, blends to the white, blends to the black. And so you could just move that around any way you want. You change where it is. So this, this whole action itself is actually very powerful just by itself. And that's why it's part of the full spectrum gradient map 1.3 product for $20, or it's included in this action set. So let me just close that and we'll do the next action split the hue, the chroma, and the black. This one's really simple. Pretty much just shows you the image split into the hues, the chroma, knocking those hues out, and then the black blending over it all. This is like the, uh, like the grayscale image part. So you can make some adjustments directly to those if you want. Let's close that. Then the next one is you can actually take the tints and force those to be hues. And doing this trick, you could then separate some images with the tints by um, doing like a regular primary hues based separation. So let's do force the tints to hues. Okay, so that basically pushed all of the tints that we had on all of the hues. Okay, all of these little tint points have now become pure chromatic hues themselves. Okay, so that it's a trick that you can use and it's in some of these other actions. And that's why I put it in here, you could be and you could do it again, really, if you want to push them even further. So what you would do is go through and separate the primary colors out like let's say you didn't have a lot of the pure bright colors, and you just had mostly tints in the image, you could force all those tints to be pure hues, run one of the primary hue methods, and then convert those back to tints. And you'd have like a tints separation. Okay, oh, let me just open that test file back up again. Okay, so then we've got force the shades to hues. So it's the same thing, but instead of the tints, it works on the shades. And you could you could run it again to push them even further. And then the next one we have is force the tones to hues. So this then works by basically using the saturation to make the tones all go into hues as well. So now we've got the midtones being forced into hues. Okay, so let's close that file. 
The next one we have is swapping the hues and the grayscales. And this one's really interesting. It looks crazy, but there are some advantages to using this. It's a certain technique, but uh, you know, I'll just show you. It really just does the hues and grayscales gradient map. But once it does the gradient map, it's going to swap where the full hues are and where the grayscales are. So it looks crazy, but what it does is basically it has converted all of the hue regions into this gradient here of grayscales, and it's converted all of the grayscales into a, a band of hues gradient like so. And I think uh, if I wanted to see the layers in here, I could probably just go to edit, um, undo, let me just see. Yeah, we can undo a couple times and get back to the uh, layers so you could see that. Okay, so you can see now all the hues have been converted into this gradient of grayscales, and all of the grayscales have been revealed and converted into this gradient of hues. It's a very interesting effect, and it does have some uses. Okay, the next thing we have is this tonal values checker. This thing can actually help to analyze the image, like I was showing, trying to figure out the difference when looking at images between whether they are full color, primary color images, like primary full color blend images, or whether they're custom images. And one of the things you can do with an image like that is um, you can go through and do this val tonal values checker action. Clicking on this is actually going to split up the image into two different regions. Now, one of the regions is like the pure tones check. And so this is where I've gone through and for every hue, I've gone and basically split and extracted just the outer edge of the, of the tints, the chroma, the shades, and the grayscales, and also just the midtone. But I've left all of the other midtones that would be in these other regions and split them to a secondary tones check. So it'll kind of tell you that if a lot of the image is showing up in the pure tones checker, you'll see those bright colors, those um, like really dark, pure black, gray, uh, medium gray, light white. You'll see those as all being like more pure, um, just totally neutral. And you'll see some of the tints and the shades and the hues. You'll see midtones, but you won't see a lot of secondary midtones. Okay. But if the image is mostly showing up in just the secondary midtones, then you know that it might be not made of totally dark black or totally um, you know neutral gray and white or a really pure chromatic hue or just standard midtones themselves. And it can really help just looking at an image this way and see seeing before you go into some of these other actions, what action you might use to run it through. Now, a lot of these actions are, they're not necessary for the most basic use of the photo tessellator, which is the fast photo filter that I showed in some of the first videos of this product. And they still run the same way. And so you can quickly go into an image and you don't have to do like the tonal values checker. You can just go straight in and start doing um, things that you had done before with these images. Um, so let me like maybe open up one of these test files here and yeah, I'll just bring it in. Okay, so we're going to look at a couple different things now. I will show you some of these other actions. So if you do want to just go into index mode, you can do that through these menu shortcuts in this next section. You can change the master image size first if you know what you're um, going, going to be running some of these other actions, like the fast photo filter. You might want to increase the image size to 600 dpi or 1200 dpi just to have the halftones be a higher resolution. Um, the edit color table only works when you're in index mode. So you could go to index mode, make some changes, um, convert it into index, and then use these to edit the color table and then change it back to index again. And so these are based on a certain workflow that I'll show in some other videos. When I use these actions, it's usually after running some of these other ones. There's also a new merge composite layer action. So you can just generate a merge composite of all the layers. So I think what I'll do is using um, this test right here. Actually, no, first I'm gonna show you guys this other group right here, the generate pattern layers group. 
So you can have an image, I'm going to show you first on a grayscale gradient. I can, and you know, I might want to increase the image size first, because right now I'm at 300 dpi. Uh, I could go to 600 dpi and the halftone dots would be a little bit better resolution. So I'll actually do that. I'll go to 600 and we'll just do nearest neighbor. Okay, so I've increased the image to 600 dpi. Now I'm going to do generate pattern layer actions. There's three of them. So instead of just one before I think I had, now there's three. This make rotated pattern layer will essentially do what some of these other actions do, which is just generate a new halftone pattern filter layer over your original image. It's going to pop up with a different view than it used to do. It used to have a way that you'd have to type in a layer name. You didn't really have to type it, but it would pop up and you'd have to like just hit enter to go through it. Now it goes directly to a pattern overlay effect on the layer. Here's where you would click and change the pattern if you wanted to change it to any of these other patterns. Right now I'm just going to keep it on the round halftone dot. And then I'll just only change the scale. I'm not going to change the angle. I've got the sales scale set to 19%. And that's because inside the LPI calculator folder, let me just um, let me go to that real quick here. In the LPI calculator folder in the downloads of this product, you've got a set of tables. And so if you're at 600 DPI, you can see what LPI you'd have if you really know a certain lines per inch you want for the half tones. If you're doing like a screen printing thing, you can say, okay, um, if I want at 600 DPI, a 50 LPI half tone, it's going to be a 18.8% or you round up or down to an even number there. So it'd be a 19% scale. So when I'm in here, I've got it already set to 19%. I've sort of default things for 600 DPI, but I've got Actions at the bottom that I'm going to show you, you can change the settings a bit so that all of the actions will run at 300 dpi, 600 dpi, or 1200 dpi, and you can change these scale percentages to be anything you want really, but you could set them to some presets to work for 300, 600, or 1200 dpi for like a 50 LPI dot. Okay, so just letting this stay the way it is, I'm just going to let this pattern generate at 19% scale with the round dot, hit OK. Here's where I can choose the angle. So it's going to be 22.5, and I'm just going to have to do it twice. So if I would change the angle here, I would make sure I enter it both times. So 22.5 here, hit enter, and then when it pops up again, I'm going to say 22.5 again. Okay, so that basically grabs the pattern, puts it to a new layer over your original, and this is just a faster way to work when you have these pattern layers. If you just bring it in as a layer in Photoshop, you know, you could do that. You could go right here, just make a new pattern layer, and you could throw this in here. I could set it to that 19%, and I could even set an angle if I want, but what starts to happen is it gets a little slow. I'm going to set this to hard mix. And I can, you know, zoom in on it, work with it like this. But if I set the angle to 22 and a half, okay, it actually, it starts to slow things down a lot more. It makes it a little bit harder to work. Like even I'm just trying to zoom in and out, it doesn't really work very fast. So I'm just going to delete that and we'll work with these pattern layers that they basically, it rotates the pattern, but it sets it so it works over the whole image. Okay, so... Basically what you've got here is the image converted into halftones. You could go and put something like a levels, and you can see in real time I can adjust how light or dark these halftones are. Okay. I'll look at the whole scale for you. So you can move the black point darker, the white point lighter. You can move the midpoint darker or lighter. It's adjusting all those halftones, changing them in real time. Okay. So this is really cool stuff you can do with this. And you can actually put it over a full color image. And even this is a way to separate an image into, or to do a halftone tessellation. So let's just go ahead and do make rotated pattern layer. I'm going to just hit enter, enter, enter. And there you go. The image is now split into eight colors. It's six pure hues, red, yellow, green, cyan, blue, and magenta, plus black and white, and all these half tones are interlocking together. So this is just one quick way to do a full color tessellation. 
you can change the blending modes, do some other things with it. And that's how a lot of these actions work. But I've kind of got it all set up in a certain order. I'm going to teach you guys how this all works in this order. So let's delete that. And let's look at this again, because we're now going to do the second action included, which is make hybrid two pattern layers. So instead of just one pattern layer, we're going to make two, and we're going to split where it converts into one pattern or the other. So let's click on this action. Okay, so the first pattern is going to be a round dot at 19%. And I will just say um, OK on this at 22 and a half angle. Maybe I'll show you a different angle. Let's do one of these at 0. So I'll hit 0 and I'll enter 0 again. And now it's gone and it's doing the next pattern. So this one, instead of the round dot, I think I want to change this to be a line pattern. And instead of, uh, and then we'll keep it at 19%. So hit OK. But instead of 0 degrees, I think I'll change this to 45 degrees. Hit OK. And we're going to enter 45 again right there. OK, so what this does, if we zoom in and look at these values, it's basically gone and split. I'm going to look at this group here as well. We got two halftone pattern layers, and it's now split the levels so that at a certain point on both ends of the grayscale gradient, it's going to switch the pattern. And I can go and click on the first one, the round one, and choose where that does it. So here you've got the underlying layer, and it's going to blend with it. If I change this one, you can see I can move that point where the lines are. Choose like what level it takes over from the dots and becomes line half tones. And I can do that on the other end as well. Okay, go up here as well and affect that point. Change that blend point. So this is like the grayscale percentage at which it converts from one half tone pattern into another. And so that's called a hybrid half tone, where you've got half tones of one shape, and you can see the zero degree angle, and you can see it change to the 45 degree angle right there. So let's just cancel that. And maybe we'll delete this group. Maybe we'll go to the full color one. And we'll do the same thing again, make hybrid two pattern layers. And so you know, maybe I'll start off with one of these just to show you. We'll do, we'll do lines at 19% uh, is fine. And we'll hit OK, 22 and a half. And then we're going to do lines again. Hit OK. And instead of 22 and a half, maybe I'm going to do um, just 90 degrees. So you really see the difference here. 90, you want to enter that twice. OK, so you can really see that I've got lines at a 22 and a half degree angle, and then lines at a 90 degree angle. And it's set up on this where it does it to those different regions. If I go into the group and change, double click on this, change these blend if settings, so you can see how I can adjust where the 90 degree lines take over and where uh, they take over at the top end. It doesn't have to be that way. I could just choose them in one end or the other. Okay. And you could also uh, perhaps flip it around and have it be like the lines are only in the middle region here and the other half tone is in that region. So you can you can flip whether it's in the light regions, the dark regions, or just one half. So let's just delete this group. Let's go back to this one. And so the same thing follows for the make hybrid three pattern layers. Now you can actually make a hybrid pattern out of three different dot types. So we could choose um, you know, maybe round dots. And maybe I'll make this bigger so we can see it like 30% uh, and 22 and a half is fine. And then the next pattern, maybe I will choose the lines at 30%. And maybe I'll say uh, 45 degrees. I want to make sure I enter that twice.
And then for the third pattern that shows up, I'm going to click and choose, I think, this triangle halftone pattern that I developed. It's really cool. It's a large scale, so you got to change it down lower. I might make it like 10%. Hit OK. And maybe I'll do it at like a 15 angle. Hit OK, and then I'll enter 15 again. It's important that you enter that twice. OK, so you'll see that we've basically gone from round half tones to line half tones into the triangle half tones. And so it's basically three different patterns of a hybrid half tone. We can choose this one and change that blend point of where the round dots convert to the lines. And we can change this one of where the lines convert to the triangles. Okay. One thing I like about the triangle half tones, and let me just uh, maybe view only the triangle half tones here. Let's turn off these layers and look at it with just the triangles. The one thing I like about the triangle half tones is that they basically stay triangles the entire way through the gradient. So they're triangles here, and even when they get to the 50% point, they're just a checkerboard of triangles. And then it, they just get smaller from that point on. So they stay the same shape throughout the whole blend. OK. Let me just uh, delete this layer. And so next we're going to look at the Fast Photo Filter group, which is in the original 1.1 version of the Photo Tessellator. It basically applies the rotated pattern layer with some blending modes and then goes to index mode to basically force an image into half tones very quickly. So that's why it's called the fast photo filter. So again, you don't really need to do any of these other actions here for the preparing or the HDWB enhancements. You don't need to do any of the menu shortcuts or the generate pattern layer. The whole point of this photo tessellator is the easy way of just taking any image and quickly converting it into some halftones. So we'll start with this one. Even though it's a full color image, I'm just going to do photo tessellator sharp. And it's going to ask me, do I want 600 DPI? Sure. And then it's going to let, have me pick the pattern. So it's the round dot I'm going to use at that 19% scale. And I'll let it do 22 and a half degree angle. OK, so it applies that. And then it gives me the index panel. And here's where I can choose what colors I want to convert this into. And what I usually do with this is I'll turn the preview off first. So I'll look at the image. And so you can see what happened is the image now has this halftone pattern layer over it, but it's just sort of like filtering it a little. The image is still there in all the colors, but it's been filtered by this halftone dot pattern. Doing that and then going to index mode, you basically can just force it to become those actual dots of different colors. What I'm going to do is, um, so usually I'd start with the preview off, and then I'm going to go to palette. And we're going to choose maybe local perceptual. And we're going to start down with two colors. And then I'll turn the preview on. So you can see it's turning the whole image into just two colors. And it's sort of automatically picking like this lighter green and this darker gray color. And that's just because of how the perceptual mode works. Now you also want to make sure you don't do anything forced, no transparency. And under the options for matte, it should be none. For dither, it should be none. So this is how this particular action works with the fast photo filter. What I can do is just change this to three colors. I, I did the scroll wheel right there. So I'm using the scroll wheel to go from two colors, to, or I can press the number three on the keyboard. Now you can see it's making it out of these three colors. I could press four, making those four colors. I could do five, six, seven. It starts adding more based on what it thinks should be there. But with this type of image with the perceptual mode, it's not really that good. If I did uniform with eight colors, it actually would be almost like the full color method, but it's, it's not really the right way to do that either because it sort of forces a lot of those colors to be more contrasted. Okay, so it's mostly for doing custom colors. What I'm going to do here is go back to perceptual, maybe go back to three colors, and I'll turn off the preview. And I'll show you guys that you could actually choose whatever colors you want. So once you've previewed it, it'll give you a couple of colors from the perceptual mode, local perceptual. 
I'm going to uncheck the preview and we go to palette, click on this, then go to custom. And you'll see under the custom panel here that it's got the three colors that it set from the previous time I had preview on. Well, I can just change those if I want. Maybe I want it to be like uh, this pink here and this yellow and maybe like a dark blue. So I could just force the whole image into becoming those. It's only going to take over those in certain regions where they're close to those colors. But let's hit OK and then check Preview. So you can see it's converted the entire image into those colors blending with each other. And you've got it in half tones. But because of that yellow and that magenta, it seems to just kind of force some of the lighter hues to the yellow and some of the other hues to the magenta. It's not necessarily blending that much of the mid-tones. It's doing a little bit of the mid-tones on this side. So it really matters what colors you pick. And that's why I you really just got to show you guys a whole bunch of videos on this stuff. Now, if you stop the action through like that, I think I, I canceled it. If you see an action show up red, you can, you can click off of it right here into one of these and it resets it. But the problem is you really want to be aware when that happens and go and open the actions, take them off the button mode, and then you'll see that the action has actually you know, opened up a little bit here. All of the actions you can go and, any action, you can click on it, and this little arrow will uh, open the action and let you show what's in there. So if you see one of these actions opened up like that, you can go back off of the button mode and close that action like this. You just want to be aware of that because sometimes they'll bug out a little bit if you have too many actions that have stopped. So I'm going to go back to button mode. If there's too many actions that have um, stopped like that midway through, you're going to want to be aware and go through and make sure they're not all opened up. Okay, so let's just close that. It's a good thing to see when it happens and just do it right then and there. So let's click on this again. Actually, let's run on this color separation techniques image I set up. And this is using some AI artwork. And then I just typed in some text. It kind of made like a cool poster. What I'm going to do with this one is do the photo tessellator sharp. Let it go to 600. I'm just going to let it pick that default round dot pattern, 22 and a half degree angle. OK, and you'll see that it did this where it picked five colors, local adaptive. And it's got the preview on. So you can see it's already taken this image and split it into these custom colors with half tones interlocking together to make the whole image out of just five colors. It looks really cool, but it's different from the original image for sure. Okay, unchecking preview, you can see I'm missing some of these lighter yellows, some of these more magenta colors, the oranges. So I could change this to perceptual turn on the preview and there's not much difference. Sometimes there's a lot of difference between perceptual and selective and adaptive. So you can just check them like that. I could go to local perceptual and then set the colors down to maybe just two. So I can see the whole artwork converted to just these two colors in half tones. Okay. Or I can see it and I, I might change it to selective and see what it picks there. That's doing kind of just a white and black adaptive. Okay, but let's just keep it on perceptual for now. And let's change the color count to three, four, five, six, seven. You can see it's starting to add more and more colors. Sometimes they're not really the brightest colors they could be from the original artwork. Let's say I want to put this in four colors and uncheck the preview. Then I can go to the palette and choose custom and see what those four colors are. I could pick different ones if I wanted to maybe pick this dark color here and pick the white and then maybe blend this color. Sometimes when you're clicking on this, it's switching around a lot because there's those little dot patterns in there. You can go up to the sample size, change it to like 11 by 11 average and then make it pick more of an average of what those pixels are. But you want to be careful when you do that, set it back to point sample or else you'll still have that setting there. Okay, so let's hit okay on that color and then let's click this one and maybe we'll do it in this lighter green color. Maybe I'll click that 11 by 11 average. 
and then click off of that again to point sample. So hit OK. So we're going to do like a dark blue, almost black, sort of an almost white, and then this uh, darker, I guess it's like a teal, almost like a dark teal, almost like a navy, and this lighter um, pastel, like lime green color. Hit OK, preview, and there we go. And so this stuff is just really incredible. I've been working for over 20 years in screen print, artwork, color separation, printing, all sorts of graphic design stuff. Um, 10 years or more, I've been working on color separation automation techniques, all the different plugins and actions and products I've been putting out over the years. And this method is just so fast and so easy and so simple. And I think that it's just best if a lot of people doing things, especially like screen printing, can see and use a technique that's just so easy to quickly take an image and you want to you know, keep it down to a certain number of colors. If it changes the art, but you can show someone like a client what that looks like in those four colors with these halftones and you can just produce this as screens and print it, then the customer proves on that and they're okay with how it might have changed a bit. If you want to really reproduce the full colors of this and not custom colors, you might start going into those some of those other full color techniques. But you can still do this with just more colors. So I could go into turn off the preview, go into custom, maybe start adding some more colors like this. And I might pick that sample thing, change it to 11 by 11. So I'm going to click here, add that cyan. Maybe I'll click and add this purple. Maybe I'll add this kind of yellow color here, or maybe from his eyes, it's really bright. Sometimes you want to look for the brightest point of color there is there. I might change that to a point sample again. Try and get the brighter points. Click on this. Maybe I'll get this uh, orange color here. And then let's try one of these darker colors. Like this magenta color. Hit OK. Let's do preview. Okay, so that's that's doing a lot more of the colors. And it's changing it a bit somewhat. This is the way that the fast photo filter really works. So you can look at it, check the preview. But if I just hit OK, let the action finish, once I made those decisions, it's basically in this indexed mode where I go to image mode color table, or we can use the menu shortcuts now, and we can go to edit color table and you can see all the different colors that we extracted we can change any of those colors around or we can start making the separations out of this like you could really change any of these colors to a separation just by let's say the cyan color right you can click on that change this to black hit ok change all of these i'm like dragging and clicking left click and drag over or do one at a time like left click this change it to white left click this change it to white and do it that way. Change each of these to white. And so there's a separation or a positive ready to print for those colors. Let's cancel that though, because you'll be changing all the colors here. All right, and we want to maybe look at it and see how many colors did I pick? It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, it's really nine colors. Um, I built some actions. I didn't build it all the way to nine. I've got it going to eight. So let's actually, let's reduce one of these colors down. I'll show you the one of the techniques I use for that. So let's edit the color table and let's maybe take these two purples and make them the same. So this one is 269, 43, 43. So if I set this one right here to be the same as that one, 269, 43, 43. I kind of eye dropped on it. Sometimes it doesn't work. Um, so or you can't really see the dot and get pick on the right one. So if you just set it manually, that works too. So if I hit OK, those are now set to the same color. I'm going to hit OK here. What I want to do is go to RGB mode and then index, but do it in exact colors. So I set up an action to just do RGB and re index exact. Now when I do edit color table, it's down to eight colors. Let's say you would run an eight color index separation through the fa fast photo filter and you want to convert all these to um, separations. 
Now you can just run the fast index to layers. So after the fast photo filter and it's um, up to eight colors, I can run the fast index to layers and just pick the right one. So I'm going to pick eight index, eight color index to layers. It brings up and does it again. It's basically running it into index mode. You don't have to run it first, but if you don't do it with the halftone patterns first, it's just going to be index pixels and not these um, exact halftone dots. So you can just let it be. It's already, you know, they're already just like a few colors. It was already eight colors of an index mode. So I can let it go to eight exact and just hit OK. What it's going to do is then go through and split all of those colors to layers. And it's going to give you a color version. And one of the versions is also going to be in black. So you could use it as like a positive or a film that you print out to do screen printing separations. So here's a merged color composite on top. Turn that off. And then you can see we've got the color layers. And we've got the color 8 color, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. And so you can see each of these colors as a uh, color. So there's color 4 and it's color. And then here's color 4 as a separation. So let me turn that one off and look at it as a separation. And then there's the color 3 as a color. And then there's the color 3 as a separation. So you could really just go through right away to this and start printing them. One of the things people do when they print is they have registration marks around it. And I'll show in some other videos how to add the reg marks to each of these. You can just add it to this whole document and then print it out so that each of these separations has those registration marks on it. Okay, so let's just close that. And maybe we'll run through that one more time. We'll take this image. We'll do the fast photo filter, maybe the fast uh, photo filter, the photo tessellator soft. And we're going to hit OK on 600 DPI. I'll just hit OK on the, I'll just hit Enter on the pattern and the angle. And I think I'll let it do the five colors that it's just picking automatically. I'm just going to hit OK. Then I'm going to say five color index to layers. We'll click on that and we'll just let it do five exact. And it's just going through and basically doing what I was showing you by going into the index mode and changing those colors, one of them to black and the others to white, or it really moves them to transparency. So the merge composite shows you a better idea what it looks like. You, know, you can see when I'm zoomed in, it still looks the same, but sometimes when you zoom out in Photoshop and you have all these layers combining together, it'll, it'll change the way it looks. Right at that zoom point, it just changes. It's not really how it looks, though. Okay, so the merge composite gives you a better idea of that. But again, we've got color 5 and color, color 4, color 3, 2, and 1. So you can see there's that color 5. If you printed it, it's basically like you take this separation, it exposes into a screen, okay? And then when it's on the screen, it goes and becomes that color. You put the color of ink into the screen, and then you print this color through the screen. What it does is then blends with the other colors, and then it creates that whole image. Okay, and there's the preview. So again, that's a quick way to do the fast photo filter and the index to layers to sort of automate the splitting of that after it's done. Let's close this and close this. Okay, and then maybe we will also just close this file right here. So after those two groups, the fast photo filter and the fast index to layers, now we've got these custom color modes that I did have in the 1.1 version, but I had them so they couldn't really automatically set the colors for you that you were picking. And I've set up a whole bunch of different new ways that this works. I'm just going to show you guys maybe the first, just the first one. And we'll get into some of the others in the other videos. So we're just going to start off with the one custom color pull live rip. So now what this does is you click this button and it'll ask you to pick a color from the image. So I'm going to pick maybe, I don't know, this like darker gold brown color. And we're going to hit OK. And we'll let this go to 600 DPI. And we'll pick the halftone pattern. We'll just pick the defaults. Enter twice on that.
And so what it does is it sets up a difference color extraction and it comes from the original art and then it has some settings on how to control the levels of that. It applies the halftone pattern and then it shows it all in the color over the original. So you can see going into where I had selected it, I can go to the levels and if I look at the properties in real time, I can basically change the levels of this halftone extraction. You can see right there, okay, see the dots basically overlapping the original art. And I could like make it darker, fill it in. So you could actually go through on an image and extract a color and you could maybe do it like one at a time. Okay, I could change this layer name. Maybe I, I would right click this, convert it to smart object. And maybe I would go back to this file, click on the one custom color pull live rip again. Maybe I want to pick like this red color here. We'll hit OK. We'll hit Enter on this. So there's the red pulled as its own halftone color layer. Okay, we can adjust it, see it in real time as halftones over the original. And if I wanted, maybe I could combine these into the same document. I'll right click and convert to smart object. So it's easier. And then I can maybe drag this window out and you can see the other one here. Click on that document and click on this document. And now I can drag this over here and I'll close this file. And we just want to make sure we put this in place. Okay, you can see it right here. I might have to do view snap and let it snap into place just like so. And we just see, yeah, it's directly, might be one pixel off. Let me just see here. No, I think that's right. Okay. So it's gone into place. So now I actually have both of those colors extracted and they're both in the same document. So you can go through and I could right click and convert them back to groups and adjust both of them. But it's like that's working on an image one color at a time, really. And it's kind of hard to get all those colors to then blend together with each other the right way you want them to do it. There's another button to custom color pull live rip. And this one works basically if you have a gradient in the image between two colors and you want to extract it. Maybe I will go back to this other test image and we'll just kind of take a look at that. Might might show up kind of might work kind of interesting on this one. You know, um, well, maybe there isn't really a gradient that I guess I could go from this one to this or maybe this color down to here. Let's try it out. Two custom color pull live rip. So the pull is going to try to extract just those colors. So let me click on this as color one, hit OK. And maybe we'll go down to this level here. It's a little bit gray or brown. We'll, we'll do it to that. Or actually, you know what? I'm going to do it to these two, this gradient up here from this color over to this color. And then you'll actually see a little bit more of the isolation that happens. So let's hit OK with those two colors. It's going to try to extract the gradient region of one to the other. So let's hit OK on the 600 DPI, hit OK on the pattern, the angle. And again, I'll show you guys in a future video just how you can go through in these actions and set it up so it has your own settings for these uh, halftone patterns, the percentage of the scale, the angles that you want to use, and let it run through just totally automatically every time. So you don't have to keep hitting OK and, and making those decisions to pick it. OK, so this has taken those two colors. And you almost don't see it that well yet because they're kind of blending so good with the art. But it's gone and put those two colors over the original. If I just put a new layer in between the original, okay, like black, you can see how it's extracted the gradient of those two colors. And they're actually not blending totally together there, and that's because of the isolation. So if we go in, there's a thing called the isolation group, 
And that sets up how much these colors blend with other colors, even though they, we want them to blend with each other. So we will go into this color two isolation group, the levels there. And we might want to just move this a little bit darker on this point, the black point. And we'll go into the other one for the custom color one right here, isolation group two, and we'll go to this one's levels and we'll darken that up as well. Okay, so you can see we've added, we've blended this color over to that color. It's kind of not capturing the brighter yellow because I, what I really picked was almost too much of an orange color. And really, if you want to try it out, you could turn off the isolation group. Okay, oh, actually, you know what? I was adjusting the wrong one. That's why I wasn't working. Let me go up to the isolation group, open that, go to the levels in the isolation group. And the same thing here for the color two, we would want to, yeah, not do the color two levels. Yep, that's, that's my bad here. So let's go into the custom two color blend isolation group, go into there, change the levels for isolation group. There, we're gonna darken it up on this one. We're gonna to go to this one here, the levels for the isolation group right here and change this. Okay, so now we're getting a little bit more of them to blend with each other across that gap. And let's just go into this one, darken that up a bit more. But again, we're seeing a little bit of uh, area where they're not blending together. And let's just look at the original. And we can see that that's because this is a brighter yellow color that I just didn't select. When I was picking this orange, and blending it all the way to this green, technically those two colors won't really blend together to make that lighter yellow. And so it kind of just knows that it won't do that and the, the math, how the math of those two colors works out. What I could do is go back and pick a brighter yellow um, and see if those, those would work. It's really all based on if the gradient in the image is actually blended from those two colors. But this is why it's called a pull instead of the total blend. And this is really cool stuff actually. So if we go into this, we can adjust those isolation levels again. Maybe I'll turn on that, that black thing. And if you go to the other side of the um, isolation levels, you can control where it blends in the other regions, like how it blends to other stuff. Let's maybe try it again. Let's just delete this and go like this. Let's try to take the two custom color pull live rip. And actually, I'm going to close this document. We'll start from the original. What it does a lot of the times is duplicates the document so it doesn't ruin your original document. Let's go to two custom color pull live rip. And this time we're going to extract either maybe a little bit brighter point like this over to that one. Or maybe we'll try that other one that we we're looking at. Let's, let's try to get this one right. So we'll pull it like this point here, blending all the way to this green here. Or it could even, it could blend over to here. But a lot of times what happens is this is a lighter green, that's a darker green, it might not work. So I'll just blend it to the lighter green. So you really just got to pick those two colors and let it go through. So I'm just hitting enter on all of these. Okay, and so once this is finished, we'll take a look and see if that gradient was captured a little more true. And what we can do is put a black layer underneath this. We can see a little bit more of that. Let's go into the isolation layer, isolation group for this one. Levels for isolation group. Let's darken that up a bit. Go into this one do the same thing. Darken that up a bit as well. So yeah, it's, it's interesting because what happens is it's kind of looks a little bit dirty where it doesn't have all of those things blending together. You could try to darken up the main levels. Let's close the isolation group, go to the main levels, sort of fill them in a little bit. We'll go to this one's main levels inside custom color one, 
not the isolation group, but this levels right here. And we'll darken that up a bit. So we can sort of force it to smooth out. But basically, we, um, you know, it's, it's only one way of working with an image to try to capture the blend. And I guess this is good for you guys to see because in comparison to the other methods of the photo tessellator, uh, it's kind of like difficult. This is why some of the color separation process is difficult when you're trying to look at things as just one color at a time or two colors at a time. If the gradient in the image was, you know, correct, like let me show you how this would work if the art was created perfectly. A lot of times artwork is not created in some sort of perfect fashion where they just blend one color to another. But let's just look at maybe like two by eight inch. Um, we can keep it at 600. Let's put a gradient in here. And we're going to just make it like uh, standard black to white, 0% smoothness. And now I'm going to change this to any color I want. Okay. I think, I think this is what the, the purpose of me showing you this is. It really does extract two colors if they are blending to each other and they've been set up as just a gradient of one color to another. So let's say you even had this darker navy color and it was blending to some sort of like orange color, even like a, a tone, like a tint, maybe like a khaki color. Okay. So as long as these are set up as one color blending to the other, if I hit OK, um, and you know, maybe I'll even show you that this is a better idea. Um, let me click OK. We want to make sure the method of the gradient is classic. We'll hit OK with that. Let's go to that poster and let's actually try to pick the two colors that didn't seem like they were blending before. Maybe I'll rotate the document. Okay, and let's go to this gradient and change it up a bit. So we want to try to pick this color here, blending to this color. And now we'll see that it's actually giving a little bit more of a true rendition. We can see this was actually having a lot brighter of a color in the middle. So that's why trying to capture that gradient from those two wasn't pulling some of that stuff because that's not really what those two colors would blend and give you. Okay. But here we've actually got them set, like I can choose this color over on that side and choose this color or that over here. Let's just like choose that brighter one. Hit OK and hit OK. Now um, I want to make sure I've just got a flattened image here. So we're just working with this gradient in this image. So if I just do two custom color blend, uh, not the live rip one, but the two custom color pull, that pull live rip one, not the blend one. The blend does the whole image like an index. So now we're going to click this color here, blending to this color there. And so this one should actually capture the gradient more correctly. Let's just hit enter. Let's go through and let it process. Okay, so there, that's pulled the two colors blending to each other with interlocking halftones. Okay, and so really it works correctly if the art is built correctly between those two color blends, but that's the thing. You're not always going to look at the art and know exactly whether some of these colors blend with each other or not. And, you know, what, why would I just want only that gradient when I'm trying to maybe get the entire image into different gradients of colors? But these tools I build because of the possibility. I really am exploring all of the possibilities and what I can do in extracting colors from an image, converting them into separations or just recoloring it or doing these halftone tessellations, things you can use for screen printing or all sorts of other purposes that I'm really going to get into and show you on this YouTube channel. So if we do two custom color pull live rip, and maybe I'm going to try to do this color, hit OK, and maybe blend it down to this color. And, you know, maybe those ones are closer to each other, and I can kind of see already this gradient should work out nice. 
we'll hit OK and go through just picking the default patterns. Yep, hit OK on that. And so with this one, yeah, it actually worked really nice. We captured this color, blending all the way to this color. And you can see it's got it somewhere in other parts of the art as well. And that's really like what the isolation layer is doing. Okay. So the, and you can see it's actually blending the, this text was the same color as the middle color here. And if we go to that isolation group layer, you can click into that. And now you can see a little bit more about how that works. Okay, I can try to remove some stuff from the iso from the other areas that it shows up. It's really easier to see in a different image, actually. So that gradient worked out nice. But I guys, I want you guys to see how this sort of um, thing works, basically. Maybe I can just show you in one of these tests. So let's do two custom color pull live rip on this right here. I'm going to just choose the red blending to the black. So we should be able to capture the gradient of the chroma to the shades, or I'm sorry, the, the chroma all the way to the black there. And it should give us like a shade of red by having the black and the red almost like a checkerboard pattern interlocking with each other. And what I want you to see with this is how the isolation thing really works. So it's basically using a different halftone pattern to knock out at a different angle where these two gradients overlap with each other. You can turn off the isolation group completely, but I want to show you how the levels part of it works. So right now I'm on the black. I'm going to go to the levels for isolation group, and I'm going to reduce this down. And you'll see when it gets lower and lower, I'm basically reducing whether that black is blending into these other areas or not. And we'll go to the red in the isolation group, open that up, click on the levels for isolation group, and bring this point down for the red also. So we can actually cut the red out of being in any of those other green areas. We kind of have it being like mostly made of the gradient of the black to the red right there. So it keeps this part intact, but it tries to cut back where it's, those are bleeding into each other. But again, this is one of the reasons why, even if you can capture a perfect gradient of two colors to each other, how do you get them to then both blend with a third color? And so this is the whole reason behind these actions is yeah, you can do one color pull, you could do a two color pull, but when you've got three colors all blending together, and it's a certain way, something like this. So, and this is why I designed these test images. I really challenge myself as much as possible on how can you automate something like this? You get an image like this. Now this one's constructed out of perfect blends of these three colors, but could I try to extract an image, even if it was close to having some, you know, being blended out of just three custom colors or force it to those three custom colors. But what if it's really made out of just three colors and I want to print or you know, change it. It could just be used as an artistic effect. But let's say I wanted to print this and use those three colors to print it. So if I just tried to pull the two colors, you'd see what would happen is it wouldn't, it wouldn't really capture how those blend with the third color. And how could you then grab the third color and make it blend with the other two? You'd be going back and forth too many times trying to get them to extract that way. I can force an image to the two colors. Let me just show you that one as well. Let's let's close this up and let's uh, let's look at this and just force it to two colors. Let's close this test file here and let's close this as well. So working with this one, we're going to try to change it to a two custom color blend live rip instead of the pull. The blend is just using the index mode now to force the image into only two colors. Okay. So this method is going to let us pick the custom colors first before applying a halftone pattern, then convert them into colors that will interlock with each other 
and it'll make the, these two colors interlock. So if I just uncheck the preview, I can maybe pick the colors I want with the custom mode. Maybe I want it to be like this cyan color blending to um, maybe this purple color. Hit OK. Depends on whether it works good or not. This That kind of looks nice. You may see some artifacts in there, like all these little pixels and these lines and stuff. You want to ignore it and see if it just um, doesn't come out in the final result. Usually what happens is this blurs it a little bit and runs through those half tones, and you just don't see those artifacts. But sometimes they're bad in certain areas, depending on how the image is set up and the colors that you pick really matter. So I'm just going to hit OK and let this run as a two-color blend. So the old version, the 1.1 version of the photo tessellator, it did not have this method of going to the custom colors and then putting them in the colors. So it would leave it in like a red to yellow, and then you'd have to kind of go back and change the red and change the yellow into those two custom colors you picked. Well, now I've got it set up so it'll go through the index mode. It'll convert those colors. It'll grab those colors in what they really were. And then it'll apply the halftone pattern. And you can just go through and you can choose whatever halftone pattern you want. But it applies it, and then you've got everything in those two colors. So now it's really cool in the new update. It's basically ready to go in those two custom colors that you picked. And we can see how now they're halftones interlocking together of two custom colors. The whole image has been forced into just those two colors. And I can go into the halftone composite merged index. And we can look at it as an index file, image mode, color table. See, those are the two colors. I could close that. You can also turn off this layer and look at the two different colors by themselves. And you can still actually adjust them because that's why it's called the live rip. Okay, I can actually still adjust the one color blending on top and this color blending below. I could even change the colors of what they were there. I could apply a colorizer to this and change that. Um, you know, if I just double click this and change the color with a color overlay. So we can make that any color we want. You can also just look at the, um, look at it as a separation. Like let's turn that one off and then let's turn off the colorizer layer. There's a separation of it. Okay, so that's all set with that one. Now, what if we wanted to do three custom colors and what if it's like this kind of an image and so this is one of the things that i was really after for years was figuring out how could i get into an image that someone made out of just a few custom colors and you know if you did the let's, let's apply that make, make rotated pattern layer thing so i can show you let's just hit okay and let it go in there as a hard mix blending mode so you could reproduce this image with the primary colors but what you'd have to do is go through and use a red, a yellow, and a black and white, and possibly also a cyan and a blue, or maybe merge those together to one blue. You could try to merge these two to an orange and these two to one blue and try to still get this. Uh, let's make new merged composite layer to see how that looks a little bit. So it'll, it'll reproduce this image in those primary colors, but this is much more difficult because you've got very tiny percentages of color and they're mixing a lot with just the black and white. There's black and white dots everywhere overlapping those hues. You could print this with a method of doing the hues that blend together and then the black and white overlapping or maybe a black and a gray and white. But what if you really just want to print with the custom colors? And so that's like one of those challenging types of separations or a challenging type of image to try to convert into just, you know, three different colors that all blend together. But let's do it with the new Max Chroma Photo Tessellator 2022. And you could do this in the other version, but it wouldn't give you the colors automatically. It would just be in like a red, black, and yellow, or um, like a red, yellow, and black, or something like that. But let's just do it now where we have the new version, three custom color interlock. And so it goes through, it's going to pull up that index mode and actually I want to just double check the resolution it's at let me cancel this you really want to be aware of the image you're at and you see how that action appeared red when I canceled it I want to go in off of button mode and I want to make sure I click on this action and click that arrow to close it up 
click back and go to button mode. This is just all workflow stuff that really helps with using these kind of actions. So let's close this document. Let's look at this really quick here. We got to close this one too. Back to the original. I want to go up here into image size. Okay, 10 inches by 8.7 and 300, this is fine. If you have an image that's a lot bigger, sometimes it's just gonna run slower. So let's click on button mode, go back to this. So we're gonna choose three custom color interlock. And so the cool part about this is, I'm just gonna uncheck preview. And we'll go in here, maybe I'll look at these ones with the hexagons. And I'll change the local perceptual down to custom because it doesn't really pick the right colors. So I'm going to click on this one and pick that color point. But again, you might not see an image and know exactly what color points it was made out of. It might not have really been made out of just a few color points. But the point is that you can take something that was done this way and there you can extract all this stuff automatically. So I set those three colors. I'm going to hit OK on it and just hit OK. You can also decide at this point if you don't want it to be diffusion. I'm going to hit preview, and see it. You usually want to check that and see if the way that you've chosen the images when you hit preview, like I didn't even see a change. I got to zoom in on this to see that change. Uncheck. Check it on. So now you can see that there's this color, the blue and the orange, and the blend in between the two is now being made out of the blue and the orange. Same with this one and that one. The midtone is being made out of all three colors. Okay, it's very important. This is going to get all three colors to interlock together. What you could do at this point is you don't have to diffuse them together. You could go to no dithering and this would be like three spot colors. It would make the whole image into just those three colors, but they wouldn't really blend with each other at all. The dithering, if I set it at 100%, they blend all the way. But if I set it to zero, it's the same as no dithering. So diffusion set to zero is the same as um, just having the dither off. Or you got to keep it at maybe 1%. And let's let the preview. So if it's at 10%, you're going to see some more blending in between. See how there's these lines right here that are like adding more blending? 20%. Thirty percent, forty. Okay, so you could go all the way up to hundred, and then this is going to blend all of the colors together, all the way to their endpoints. Okay, so let's just uh, zoom out on that, and let's just hit OK and let this run through. We picked those three custom colors. It looked good in the index. It seemed to be blending them all correctly together. And so the thing is, it's not always going to work, though. There are some colors in the index mode that will interfere with each other. And so that's one of the things I want to show you guys. I might, I might let this run, or I might just try to go to the desktop to show you. We'll see if this will just finish running. Or there we go. I can show you. So if you had something like this gradient of a red to a white, to a gray. The problem is the gray will actually take over all of those tints. So I have another action in there now in the new update that allows you to even handle something like this. So that's why I'm really excited about all this stuff I've been working on with this update. Here's the action continuing to run. It stopped at the 600 DPI point where I want to choose that resolution. And we're going to hit OK on this. So the old action before this update would have just left it at like that red, white, and black. Now this one is actually setting all those custom colors and extracting them to the different layers. And then it's giving you this finished photo tessellated image in three custom colors that all interlock together. And so to me, this is just amazing stuff that I worked for years trying to figure out a way to get these kind of things. And it turns out it's pretty simple how it works. It's just using a lot of those advanced methods of converting images to index and then converting those into colors that I can get them to interlock together with the other separation methods. 
And so it all combines together to make something really simple and easy out of a uh, what used to be a very challenging process. You couldn't even figure out how to do it sometimes when you're trying to just manually pull one color or another color and try to get three colors to all blend together the right way. And they're all custom colors, you know, can you can you extract it with the color range tool? Sometimes that doesn't really work. Um, so to me, this is just amazing stuff that it can do this image in this way. And uh, so that's why I'm excited about having this update finished and ready to show you guys. I'm going to start putting out a lot of videos to show as many examples as I can possibly do. It's the whole point to this stuff is I've been working on all sorts of images over the years testing different ways of doing these things. And as I build these actions, I test them. It's not meant to just be, it only works on, you know, one kind of image. It's meant that like you throw anything into it and with the right setting, you'll get what you want out of it. So let's just close that file and let's just kind of stop the video here before we get into the four color, the five color, all the other interlocks. Um, you know, I might show like one more example here. This is one I just did the other day and uh, it just, it came out so good. This original artwork is like this and you could maybe blend this art out of like some primary colors, but what if you wanted to do custom color separation? I did a five color sep and just picking the right colors from that original during that index mode, there I use the five color, five custom color interlock. So I was able to get this image converted into these half tones. Okay, this is the original. Here's the photo tessellated. And it's just, it's pretty crazy. You know, it's getting all these colors, custom colors to interlock together and produce all these blends. And this is another AI generated artwork I did, I think on um, Mid Journey. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that's, it's just really cool. It's kind of like the stuff I'm all about doing. I, I'd like to be able to take something like this come up with some creative idea, get some really cool artwork out of like one of these AI image generators and then take it right to print and convert it to like five custom colors, half tone separated and go right to press. And so, you know, I'm really excited to show you guys this stuff. I've got a lot of new things coming out, um, but these, the videos I'm gonna show about this photo tessellator is what we're gonna focus on until we've kind of shown all the videos for every part of it and even more with just lots of testing. And then we'll even get into just doing some printing videos with this stuff. But I'm gonna finish this video now and we'll uh, see you in the next video. We'll just continue on with more instructions about how to use the Max Chroma Photo Tessellator 2022. And this is the 1.8 update. So thanks for watching and stay tuned for more. Subscribe if you wanna get updates about more videos. Click like if you like this video. Leave me a comment if you have any questions. And uh, thanks again.